All right, we are live. Hey, hi, and hello. I am Ray Lockdust, and I am here with Alice Rose today. We are going to get uh, sober and serious about our uh, history with addiction, actually. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to delve into what we have to talk about. We are going to not play Jeopardy today. Um, it is just a grid. It is a lie. Um, our questions will be answered in the form of answers because, well, that really limits the answers. And I like to talk. So we're just going to play it by my rules. <laughs> so we will um, get Alice in here and we will begin. <laughs> Hi. Hey, hey. How's it going? Oh, it's so good. Um, Happy anniversary! I thank you. I thank you. She's four today. That's right. Oh, I'm so happy. That was the exact thing I described when I was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy. Yeah. So I got my little birthday girl pin and we got a cake and everything. I have a cake story, but we'll get into that later. Yeah. So um, to begin, what makes today your anniversary? Um, today is, so my coming out was really messy and I don't really have like a date of coming out to a bunch of people. Yeah. Um, and then I came out so many times as, as gender fluid and then non-binary and then maybe something and then maybe something else and then regretting it all and going back into the closet and blah, 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 blah. So I uh, stuck with the tradition of going from the day I started uh, medically transitioning. So my first prescription was filled August 12th. Uh, it's also my ex's birthday, so I love just taking that attention away from her. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's a day that my really, really good friend's uh, uh, baby was born exactly four years ago, too. So um, yeah, it's just a special little date. Yeah, it is. Um, it's my childhood best friend's birthday. So, yay! Yeah, a lot else. of stuff. Wonder it's who a magical her birthday today. Yeah. Bunch of birthday shout outs. Hello, everyone. If you're watching and it's your birthday, I hope you have a happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> who else? Sir Mix a lot. Mix a lot. Uh, Sir Mix a lot. Casey Affleck is 43 today. Uh, Yvette Nicole Brown from um, from Community. Oh, right. I was just like, I know that name. <laughs> yeah. Bruce Green Greenwood. I don't know who that is. But yeah, we've got some we've got some great people. Mm -hmm. Shout outs to all those people and a baseball guy, too, apparently. Oh, congratulations to all of you for being born. I'm proud of mm -hmm. you. Did mm -hmm. it. <laughs> all right. Um, Shall we begin with our pre-question questions? Yes. Okay. Oh, Alice Rose. What does it mean to be trans? What it means to be trans is uh, when you're when you're born, the doctor tells you you're a boy or a girl based on your genitalia. Uh, to be trans is having any reaction, but you're absolutely a hundred percent right. So being trans means that your gender does not correlate with your biological sex or your gender assigned at birth. Um, and it, uh, it expresses the complexity and the um, fluidity of gender. Amazing. That was very thorough. I'm, I love it. <laughs> I love when I don't have to add. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, what does it mean to be cis? And is that an insult? Mm. Uh, what it means to be cis is uh, typically, I, I like to think you're a cis when you've never really examined or questioned your gender, um, that you just stick with what you're given and you never really put too much thought into it. I think some people uh, experience and feel a sense of gender very strongly and some people don't. Um, if you feel your sense of gender very strongly, but it correlates with your gender roles and everything else, then you're cis. It means that your gender aligns with your birth sex or your biological sex. 
Is it an insult? Absolutely not. It's only an insult if you think that the term trans is an insult. Really, that's the only way you can be insulted by the term cis. We're not, you know, it's it's a descriptor. It's it's a term that's used to uh, used to define the connections between sex and gender. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, what um, does gender euphoria mean? I don't know. Never felt it. Oh. I don't. <laughs> That's possible. That's you can. I had um, it once. <laughs> <laughs> once. Um, actually, no. Gender euphoria. I'm going to turn my mic down because it's it's bottoming out here, and I'm getting really close to it. But uh, gender euphoria is very much that that sense of feeling very good about your gender, and your gender is a hundred percent whole. And representative of representative on the outside of what you feel on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you look at your body and you don't want to cut a part of it off, that's. that's <laughs> yeah. Um. I, I and I've also like like experienced like like the social version of euphoria, where, which is like the only way that I've I've had it, <laughs> where it's just like like um I sorry <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, once upon a time, I was taking a course, and um, we were all putting our names on our name tags, as you do with a name tag. And I just thought, like, I don't feel like verbally coming out, so I just put they them on my pro on my name tag and put it in front of me. And then someone looks over, sees this, and writes she her on hers. And then one by one, everyone in the class just like picked up their name tag and added their pronouns. No one said a thing, no one addressed it. It was just this moment of full understanding that happened. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. That's so cool when that happens. And I recently heard uh, about a non-binary person who is at like a meeting or something where they went around in the circle and gave their names and their pronouns and they felt really awkward because they they didn't know if they could be out in that space yet and everybody else was like exclaiming their pronouns and things like that and that made them feel really awkward so uh, it's 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 so difficult to like have guidelines or to know what is appropriate and it's just very important to like ask and be considerate of people. I don't know where I'm going with that, but I just, <laughs> I'm, I have so many questions about the non-binary experience that I'm so curious and fascinated about. So I think that's where I'm coming from. But yeah, sort of a step <laughs> on your conversation. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, al you're allowed to converse. <laughs> I give you permission. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, how about um, you talk about an experience with gender dysphoria? Hmm. Gender dysphoria, uh, textbook definition, is a feeling of strong anxiety or um, depression related to your, uh, your perceived gender or your disconnect with your gender identity. So gender dysphoria is looking in the mirror and seeing all of the things you hate about yourself. And it is being misgendered and how that can just absolutely cripple your day. And it's, it's, uh, it's things pertaining to gender that uh, can cause you to have a really severe reaction or a very, very uh, significant emotional response to it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my gender dysphoria, uh, it manifests itself, manifests itself when I, um, when I speak with my voice. It's something I'm super, super self-conscious about, which is strange because I make a living speaking into a microphone, but it's something I've had to, uh, I've had to overcome. Um, looking at my body, hyper-focusing on different parts of my body, um, being hypersensitive of gendered language and gendered pronouns and all of those things because they can have a profound effect on you. I don't remember the last time I was misgendered, thankfully. Just, yeah, knock on wood. But um, 
just when it happens or or if it happens or if I like mishear somebody or mistakenly hear someone like call out, excuse me, sir, and talking to somebody else, it's it's a nightmare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like sometimes it's as you said, it's like triggered by the like a little moment that someone isn't going to think of anything else of of just like oh he she oh boops embarrassing and then they continue yeah but then suddenly but it for stops you, you it's just your... like well it's a different fact yeah <laughs> it yeah. stops you in your tracks and and just uh it, it it causes you to force and come to terms with the fact that people don't see you as you are and people still see you as something else and uh, uh, as trans people, as people who feel a lot of dysphoria and a lot of self-criticism and a lot of uncertainty, um, we tend to internalize that as as things we're doing wrong, not things that other people doing are doing wrong. But you, when you're misgendered or when somebody, you know, outs you or asks you a weird question about being trans or anything, um, you think to yourself, "What did I do wrong? How did I?" How did, how did they know? What did I do wrong? What can I do better? What do I have to change in order to make other people comfortable with me? Which totally isn't our obligation whatsoever. <laughs> Fuck no. those people. Fuck everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I know who I am. Yeah. yeah. So that's my long-winded gender dysphoria, Todd. Yeah. Yeah. Gender dysphoria is a mess. Like, um, for me, when I experience it, it's like a whole ball of like, like as a non-binary person, I don't have the, um, like, I don't have the stick figure to go after. So, mm -hmm. so I just, um, I would just kind of find on a day to day, like what makes me comfortable and how I am treated. And when I find, um, for me, as I, as I kind of touched on a bit ago, um, the social dysphoria is a huge thing that affects me when people treat me like a woman, where it's just like, I get it. I wear the long haired wigs and the jewelry and, uh, you know, occasionally a cape or a skirt, but that doesn't mean I, I need help lifting things. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Social dysphoria, like I'm fortunate that I don't have a lot of physical dysphoria and body dysphoria. Um, but social is absolutely where where it comes in. Like it's it's when I'm put in a box that mm -hmm. men are put into, or I feel unwelcome or uh, hostility in women's spaces or in in spaces where I should belong that's when it really, really hits me. That's when it gets to me. Um, so most of my dysphoria is either uh, sexually in the bedroom, um, just because it, physically and biologically, it, my, I don't know how to say it, but you know, those activities are associated with a lot of maleness and, sexual partners in the past have expected uh, very stereotypically male um, sexual behaviors or sexual responses in the bedroom. And that really fucks with me. Um, but also social when people, you know, at the gym, the using the locker room and using the gym were a huge, huge struggle for me. Um, yeah, and not necessarily like looking or appearing a certain way, but just being seen and welcome as yeah. a certain gender, for sure. And I'm really curious. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your perspective because I know with with non-binary people, the expectation, like the gender presentation or the um, the stick figure goal, is like some like an androgynous type figure that like is so nondescript and there's so like it's like a lack of characteristic that causes that that people want you to achieve and that's totally unfair for anyone to impose any sort of gender standards on anyone but to not you know in such a binary world when you don't identify and you can't 
chase one extreme or the other. You can't enforce one extreme or the other. There's so much more, I'd imagine, just educating people and, you know, falling by default into one category or the other and trying to balance in between for people. Um, God, that must be, yeah. How how do you how do you cope with dysphoria? If I can ask, um, I find a lot of the time I have to settle and just like like accept a lot of the time that it's just how I feel. So a lot of the coping that I've had to do is just kind of um, choosing when to. I wouldn't even say fight my battles, but to take a moment and correct and educate. Is um, when I when I first came out, I came out like guns a blazing, just being like, "These are my pronouns, and you must respect me." And people were just like, "You're being a bit aggressive," and I don't like it. And I was, and so now I have this weird like, "Did I was I too mean?" And and so and it's just like I have every right to be assertive about my identity, but I do admit like, "Yeah, I was a bit rough." <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and it's it's. <laughs> When you first come out and you first, at least for me, when I first began to attach all of the anxiety and all of the strong feelings that I was having, once I attached that to gender, um, I felt it so strongly and I felt it so fiercely that it made me like very aggressive as well. Um, and it caused that gender dysphoria to hit so much harder because I hadn't built up a tolerance or an understanding or a patience maybe. Um, so I can totally sympathize with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a lot of um, like before I was able to actually grasp it, it was a lot of just undirected frustration of just like how dare you offer me help how dare you uh, like like things about like, like people tapping me on the shoulder being like ma'am and I'm like, how dare mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. <laughs> but then I would have like um I, my, my friends um have called them my my little like like the the peekaboo trans moments of <laughs> of like um dressing up as as a male character for Halloween and then getting like really really excited when I was mis like when I was gendered as he him and I'm like they didn't know that I was a girl they didn't know what was up <laughs> 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 and, and then I just like but I'm cis though mm -hmm. there was a lot of denial with me for a bit <laughs> yeah yeah hey it took me 30 years so I get the denial I totally understand the denial yeah. From like being 16, 17 years old and shaving my legs in the shower and just not questioning it or thinking about it and just like, this feels good. I don't, yeah. for, for as some nondescript reason, I like having smooth legs. That's, that's, mm. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, it's just the way I am. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so one, of my, one of my um, very first like non-binary thoughts um, was something along the lines of, I feel li like, I, I, I think I was like eight when I had this thought, but I feel a boy in a girl's body who's not a boy. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I just kind of like have stuck with that where I'm just like, all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like, I wonder if I could find it right quick, but I wrote a very small poem about my first expressions of of gender and of transness. And where would I find that? It's really short. I could probably, you know, um, summarize my own work. But um, when I was younger, I used to pretend that I was a girl who dressed up like a boy so that she could do boy things um, until I grew up to l learn that it was much easier to just pretend that I was a boy. Something along those lines. So my experience were was very much I would pretend that I was a girl who was pretending to be a boy. Mm 
and that's how I felt. Um, because I still liked stereotypical boy things. And I loved very stereotypical girl things as well. And I loved navigating those two worlds. And I loved being one of the girls with my girlfriends and being one of the boys with my boyfriends. Um, but it always felt like a dissociation. So I was like pretending to be a boy and then I didn't want to admit that I was a girl. So I would be a boy pretending. I was pretending to be a boy who was pretending to be a girl. And that's a really complex dissociation to have as like a five-year-old, a six-year-old kid. <laughs> you really don't know, uh, you don't know what you are yeah. when you're how, all of those things. Yeah. How do you think um, you would have, like if you didn't eventually um, come into contact with the language and the world and like the actual like existence of being trans, how do you think you would have kind of settled? Um, I, Settled is a good word. I think I would have settled with a lot of um, closeted experimentation and shame. I think I would I would not have transitioned without knowing and without having that um, framework or that blueprint to follow to have those names and have those uh, terms and paths that I could take and seeing other people. It wasn't until um, I, it was actually a funny story. The first trans person that I met was uh, in Uganda around the time that they just passed the Anti-Homosexuality Act and started putting people, uh, giving people life sentences for uh, being queer or trans so um and i remember meeting pepe who is just this incredible incredible trans man who's who's a leader and an advocate in his community and then meeting uh cleo um, who is the subject of the documentary the pearl of africa if you can find it anywhere I'd, highly recommend watching it and she's a trans woman who had to uh, seek exile in kenya because of the dangers of of living in uganda as a trans person but i remember without even having a sense of transness in myself without even having that question seeing these people and and having this very abstract thought that if these people could be who they are in a country that's so dangerous for them and in a country that hates them so much what's holding me back and i didn't even know what's holding me back from what i just i just felt that there was such an inauthenticity in me and i saw such strength in these people and such courage in these people that it caused me to start questioning all aspects of my life and wondering if they were expectations of other people, if they were ways of just being comfortable in my environment without drawing too much attention to myself, um, or if they were things that were actual truths about me. And then I started to find out there were very few truths about me at that time that I accept had accepted. So yeah. that caused a huge stage of growth. And that's when my architecture um, education started to crumble. That's when my relationship started to crumble. That's where my graphic design company uh, fell completely flat because, um, yeah, I had all of these questions to answer. But then I came out as me, and now I'm thriving and super happy, and I know who I am, and I'm very proud of that. Yeah, that's... Yeah. That is so the most important thing in that story. I like that you, you did it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's incredible the amount of strength that, and I feel like cis people are um, 
I feel sorry for cis people sometimes because they don't have to answer those questions and they, therefore they don't have these strong definite answers of who they are. And there are so many people yeah. who go through life without answering or asking themselves those very important questions. What mm -hmm. drives me? What gives me passion? What makes me happy? Who am I? All of these things people follow other people's expectations and never really, you know, I'm making broad generalizations, but there are so many people who are just, I'm going to go to work as an accountant or my dad was a lawyer, so I'm going to be a lawyer. Or, you know, the family structure, how many people end up in, you know, a nuclear family in their 30s and realize that's not at all what they actually wanted. Mm -hmm. I think that's the source of the midlife crisis as people, you know, time starts to we we get a better measurement self-measurement of time and the the length of a lifetime and we start to have regrets so i'm so glad um coming out as trans has taught me to you know if i if i can transition if i could come out to people if i could risk the um the abandonment of my family if i could risk uh, public embarrassment and humiliation, if I could risk everything, losing my job, um, losing all of my friends, my family, the the uh, higher rates of violence and murder and uh, assault and harassment that occur to trans people, if I can, if I can face all of that for this one thing, I can, I can chase my dream of being a, a comedian or an entertainer. I can chase my passion for, for community building and creating spaces, positive spaces for people. I can do those things. I can, I yeah, can date boys and nobody's going to question me. And I can do all of these things. Um, yeah, and it's, it's empowered me so much. And it's given me so much strength and so much determination to do what I want with my life. And it's led to unbelievably rewarding and fulfilling things. I have yeah. everything. I'm I'm honestly all of my dreams are coming true at exactly the same time. And I have transness and the trans and queer community to thank for it. That's amazing. It's because it's just such a big part of finding who you are is what sets you on the path to be happy like if you're just settling to do what your dad did then you don't have a chance to express yourself or to like as you said you don't get to find who you are because it was chosen and i don't need to reiterate everything you said so mm -hmm. <laughs> but but yeah that was that was very wonderfully put i did i love that um and it's it's it is um something to think about how a lot of people who are kind of like like you're you're born straight so you get to and like like you you, uh, you know identify with your gender you're good you're you're you just get to ha live that life and i um i saw I, I saw a text post that was just like 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 in a response to when people ask like, like when did you know you were gay and it's like when did you know you were straight and for them it's there is no realization because everything around them allows it to be accepted so they don't have to ever fight against the norm because they are it. And that's what kind of blocks you from having another kind of version of exploration. Absolutely. And that's why I don't believe in straight people. I don't think straight people exist whatsoever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's such a bisexual thing to say. But <laughs> I... <laughs> sorry? My, uh, sorry, one of my um, realizations into my sexuality was, well, like, I think everyone to a degree is pansexual, because how can you, like, I just, like, went into this tangent about fluidity and how, like, like everyone is attracted to, every, uh, everyone can be attractive to some kind of degree, and how, like, like, limiting yourself to genitalia is a bullshit response, mm -hmm. <laughs> and my mm -hmm. friend was just like, I think you're gay, yo. <laughs> <laughs> no. Me? Me? Um, yeah, I think that's it. You said that you're born straight. And I think that's, that's a really uh, poignant phrase, or that's a very loaded phrase to say born straight. And I think we're all 
born straight in the way that we're we're assigned that at birth you're assigned straight at birth just like you're assigned male or female at birth you're assigned those binaries yeah. and it's funny because we ascribe these qualities to children we ascribe these qualities to very prepubescent children before you know uh, uh, a majority of the brain is developed and before a majority of the personality is developed you you when you you can agree that when a person is born they don't have a sexuality and i think you can make really really strong arguments for that is that you don't have a sexual orientation when you're a child and all of the sexual orientation that is placed onto children is uh, societal. It's it's uh, nurture over nature, and I think the same argument can absolutely be made about gender. Is that we don't? I mean, there are there are gender roles and gender stereotypes that we may gravitate towards, but in terms of gender, like pure gender, that's that's completely detached from biological sex. Um, there's no way that can be defined at such a young age. And I don't think we have to raise completely non-binary babies, but you can raise babies with the the notion that statistically you're probably male or female. Most, yeah. <laughs> people, most people with vaginas grow up to be women, but that's not necessarily the, the case. You know, you can you can give them names like Laura and Fred or you know, James and whatever, but they should be raised with this idea that that doesn't have to be a lifelong thing. Mm -hmm. Just like your sexual orientation. You're people, people, that's why I said I don't believe in straight people because people never have to ask themselves whether they're straight or not. Yeah. As long as they're comfortable enough in that role. Yeah. And I know once the stereotype switched for me and I was transitioning and I'd say like, oh, I have a date. And people will ask, what's his name? And just assume that I was a straight woman. Yeah. Um, suddenly, without any of that negative association to being attracted to men, oh my God, I'm attracted to men. Maybe I will date guys. That's it's totally okay to do it. So what am I afraid of? And it, once that pressure was lifted, I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'm just attracted to everyone because I was allowed to be attracted to everyone yeah. or because I didn't feel any longer that I had to suppress that or ignore that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally felt like when I first came out and I and then I was single, I was just like, I just have to date all of the ladies just to emphasize and make up for my lost time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then I, like it also became a thing where like everyone would assume I was a lesbian and I was just like maybe like 93%, but every now and then one can wiggle in. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know I was very much the same where I was like, I, I was a straight woman for a couple of years and I was only dating men and I was dating and, you know, going home with all the men that I could. Um, experimental time, the ho days. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, it took a while to settle into like, just because I was dating women didn't mean I was a lesbian and it didn't mean I had very internalized transphobic ideas of, of um, trans lesbianism as well that I really had to struggle with because oh. we're not perfect, but yeah. Yeah. The, um, the like um, tension between straight and um, gay trans women was something that I like, because there are so many things like I don't consider because I'm just like oh it had, like until it's introduced to me because that's how learning works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I had um, two friends who were who were both trans. Um, they are both trans still. 
<laughs> and the, and um, they were meeting. One was straight, one's gay, and one of them was just like, "Oh, I'm nervous because what if she thinks that I think that I'm better than her because I'm straight?" And it, and it was just like she was afraid of the tension being between them, and I was just like, <laughs> "Um, I I think you're good, and I get where you're coming from. Let's explore this more." <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah, I felt a small sense of that too, is that when I met other trans women, I I felt like straight trans women were were more more women than I was. They were more complete women because I, you know, wasn't dating men initially and there was I don't know how to describe it or how to articulate it, but you know, I assumed that um, being straight or at least dating men made you more of a woman in my in my very very insecure days and my my insecure times. So I don't know something I really had to clean out of my brain. <laughs> Yeah. Um, do you think that it was like like a reflection of like, like of social passing? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, a big part of the reason that I I enjoyed dating men was because when I was out on a date with somebody, I was by default the woman. Mm -hmm. And if I were to date a cis woman, I would have to. I, I would feel like I'm competing with her femininity or her passing. Yeah. Um, I also felt when. And this is terrible to admit, but I, I found it difficult to be in public or in social circles with another trans woman who perhaps wasn't incredibly passing because it just drew more attention to my transness. And it was like, oh, look at those two trans people. Like I might be able to walk through the mall and get away with it. But if there's two of us, there's no way, there's absolutely no way we're going to sell through this mall. Um, Again, terrible insecurities on my part and things that I've I've had to resolve with lots of therapy. But um, yeah, there was social passing was a huge part of it. Yeah. Huge. And perhaps, especially with the men I was dating, um, I think I was more attracted to my my position in a relationship with a man than the relationship itself. I was more attracted to being somebody's girlfriend and being having a boyfriend than really having yeah. sincere feelings for that person. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's just I mean, boys are cute, but I have to reiterate, especially the men that I was dating. <laughs> <laughs> cute butt. <laughs> yeah yeah all right um let's see we have actually answered so many of the pre-question questions just through our conversation which oh my is god this amazing. is still pre-question question yeah by the way we have, we're not playing jeopardy yet all right i just wanted to have like some base i wanted to have like a base conversation to make sure that any terms that we drop will be understood and then people like to, this is our backstory the origin yeah yeah <laughs> This is Trans 101, and now we're moving into the advanced course, the AP course. I get it. <laughs> yeah, I have, let's see. I'm going to say that I have one more question, and then we'll go into the course. Or do you want to dive in? The course. Is, um, OK, I'm just going to ask the question, because I'm in charge. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what is the issue with asking about the surgery and other transitional plans? Um, what is the issue with asking anyone about their genitals when you're not sexually engaged or involved with them or when you haven't developed an intimate relationship with them? It's, uh, it's just bad table manners. It's poor conversation. It's also, uh, it sets a physical standard on gender and a biological sex standard on gender that is bullshit that we don't have to um 
that we don't have to conform to. We feel we have no obligation. I have no obligation to uh, um, shave my trachea and get rid of the Adam's apple. I have no obligation to enlarge my breasts or change my facial bone structure or my voice. I have no obligation to, to um, undergo a very, very uh, invasive and painful surgery in order to to help other people accept my gender. Um, it doesn't matter what I have in my pants because that I don't, you're never going to see it. <laughs> and it doesn't apply. Like it doesn't, what color is your brain? <laughs> Nobody thinks of that. No. Okay. But I care more about that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gray is also my We're favorite color. So like bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's something that's completely irrelevant to to pretty much anyone who's asking it. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I don't know. It's just it's it's first of all very rude and intrusive. I uh, second of all, it's an unrealistic expectation for people to uh, meet your physical ideas of gender. When you can't even, like, you'll never see it, like I said. <laughs> Just fuck off. Stop. Just fuck off. That's a let's, good reason. Yeah. You shouldn't yeah. be imagining what's in my pants. You shouldn't. That should never come up. Like, that's just sexually inappropriate. Absolutely. I had, um, I was dating, um, when I was dating a trans person a few years ago, I had my, my cousin's boyfriend was asking questions about them and just being like, yeah, but like their genitals. And I love the, the response of just, oh, do you intend to interact with their genitals? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it just like, <gasps> no, oh my, no, I would never. And it's just like, it just, turns them off because they're just like I would mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then, yeah so that's that's how I, I I deal with it I guess is I just kind of I wouldn't even say turn it around I just like question their motives and as soon as you bring that in they're just like as you said like why do you want to go why do you want to know about my genitals and yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I I actually had a uh, relationship for several months with somebody and it was somebody who had uh, physical boundaries and I also have physical boundaries. So uh, um, even though we were sexually active and even though we had dated for several months, um, we never engaged or interacted with one another's genitals. Like, she didn't know if I had a penis or vagina or any combination of the two. And I didn't know if she had a penis or vagina or if she was cis or trans, none of those things mattered. And that's totally cool. That's, that's, that's kind of awesome. Yeah. Where like genitals can be a thousand percent irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've had friends who will um, say things about like, like being sad about having a small wiener or something. And I'm just like, I have had sex, like some of my best sex has been without a wiener. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, like, it's the hang up about genitalia that is just so everywhere. And I think that's why, why it's so, like why so many people obsess over the genitals when it comes to the trans identity. They don't care about how we're dressing, how we're carving our nails to make sure that they look more feminized. They're more concerned about the gritty details, but hey, I'm just asking, I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm just curious. Yeah, just curious. Well, yeah, ew. Um, yeah, and I, I actually made it a really um, firm rule for myself not to uh, confirm my genitals on stage or in my in my material. I used to make fun of being a girl with a penis. 
Um, but I will, you know, I'd love to have it on my rider and my contract somewhere when I'm big enough to have either of those things where like, I will not state in an interview whether I have a penis or a vagina and that will not be public record whatsoever because yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And, you know, no cis person has a Wikipedia article that says whether they have a penis or a vagina or anything about their medical history. It's private medical history. Absolutely. So yeah, I used to have jokes um, and I've talked about having surgeries, but very vague about those surgeries um, yeah. because it's it doesn't weigh on my gender or my identity and I don't want it to weigh on my gender or my identity. So I don't want it anywhere to say whether I have one or the other. So I'm very careful, like, with my, the joke I used to have about uh, being born with a penis between my legs, but now I have a penis between my butt cheeks. Um, then I, you know, I added, like, okay, I do have a vagina, and then I'd come up with nicknames for my vagina that were, like, is it a penis or a vagina? Um, but then I've cut that out entirely because I don't want to bring that up at all. At all. Yeah. Because we grow as artists. Yeah, I, I like I'm very aware that my coming out story will phase out of my routine, but right now I think it's cute, so I'm working with it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's something I mean, the reason I'm a comedian was because of my coming out and my need to share that story and my need to process that story and those experiences. Um I I am doing a show in less than two weeks. What is it, the twelfth? Yeah, in about two weeks, I, about my coming out, I'm doing a 45-minute set on my coming out. It's always going to be a big part of my story, and it's always something I'm going to be very proud and, and feel a so, social obligation to share, but that's not the only thing about me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a chapter, not the thesis. Exactly. Exactly. It's like puberty. We don't tell puberty stories our whole lives, and yeah, unless you're John Mulaney, and <laughs> even then, he's so much funnier and does so much more stuff. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it works for him because it looks like he's still going through puberty. Exactly. <laughs> oh my god, and he's so cute. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, like I would. He, he's one of those people where, I, like. Like, I'd say, like, if something negative came out about him, I'd be sad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, he just just seems like a swell person. And if it turned out he did something bad, I would be slightly more angry than usual. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I, hope, I hope he's really a good person. Yeah, we believe in you, John. <laughs> Now that Tom Hanks has destroyed our faith in in men. Oh, did he? I uh, yeah, apparently he uh he's on Jeffrey Epstein's flight records for like, oh. his island and all of that stuff. So Oh. Yeah. That's disappointing. I had a conversation about like the list of like like celebrities that would make it like that would you be sad and Tom Hanks was one of my friends. So <laughs> Tom Hanks was absolutely mine. He was like, how could Tom Hanks yeah. do something wrong? How could he be a bad person? Um, yeah, he was the guy. Yeah. But RIP Tom Hanks. Yeah. Fuck. There go all my Thanksgiving plans. So I always used to celebrate T. Hanksgiving and watch Tom Hanks movies. On oh. Film. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a cute thing to do. <laughs> Uh, he has a brother. Uh, he does. He has two sons, yeah. Colin, Colin, and Chet. He has Chet Hanks. Is uh, yeah. There's that guy. He Chet, uh, Hanks. Chet Hanks, and he moved to Jamaica, so he he has a very over the top like Jamaican. Uh, 
accent and like tries to speak Padua and all of this. And it's disgusting to watch someone with almost Tom Hanks's face just pretending to be a Rastafarian. <laughs> I'll have to send you clips after the show. Yeah, oh please do. I yeah. I feel like I've missed out on a great, um, like, a big public motion of the <laughs> son of Tom Hanks and the downfall of Tom Hanks. What is happening? Yes. <laughs> I know. See, Ed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, anyway. is it question time? Should we take I, a break okay. for, for cake? Should yeah, we, let's... Can I blow up my candles first? Yes, absolutely. Okay. It's cake time. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to play a little clip. So don't mind that I'm taking over your screen, but I have a little story to share about my uh, anniversary cake. So bear with me. Story time. So today is my anniversary, which if you don't know, is like the... Uh, uh, anniversary of the day I started medically transitioning. Uh, so I went to the store and got a little cake because I'm on a podcast and it's a whole thing tonight. Um, and uh, all right, you got to see that. Okay, so she asked me if I want anything written on the cake and I say yes. How about happy anniversary? And she spells it out. I can't write it out for her because quarantine and stuff. So she spells it out. And I'm trying to explain to her, like, anniversary in one word. So she has the cake, and she starts writing, and I'm spelling for her, T-R-A, and then I say N-N-I, and she goes N-N-Y, and then she waits for me, and I'm like, I, I'm sorry, I can't take this cake. Like, for part two. Okay, part two. So I'm looking down at this cake that says tranny, and part of me is like, this is oddly kind of perfect. I'll take it. But then I remember what my therapist said, and I'm like, maybe I shouldn't make myself and my identity the butt of the joke for this. So she uh, takes the cake and she wipes it out and adds more. Uh, adds more icing, and she comes back with the cake and starts spelling it out again. And I'm going, and she writes T-R-A-N, and then she just keeps going. And this was what she got me. I guess it's as good as it gets. So happy trana -na 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 anniversary to me. <laughs> happy there we go. Uh, yeah, I'm four years old today, so get a little cake. Yay. <laughs> yeah, so thoughts and prayers to anybody named Tran who is trying to celebrate a birthday in the West End. Um, I feel your pain. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. At least they didn't refuse to make my cake on religious premises. At least they made it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't know what I expected, but that still got me. <laughs> yeah. I so started just staring down at this cake that just simply said tranny. Like she didn't write happy before that. She wanted to make sure that was there. And then when she was sm spelling this out, I was like, you can hyphenate it. You can. And then she just kept going like down the side of the cake. And I'm like, are you, are, are you broken? Do you need help? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> oh, no. You're just uh, a malfunctioning cake artist. Yeah. <laughs> And I was so defeated at that point. Like, I was holding back laughter. Fortunately, I was wearing a mask because I had the biggest look of shock and amusement in my face as she's doing this. <laughs> she's like, I think I, I think I got it. I'm like, that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> like, I didn't want to see what a third attempt would look like. <laughs> so, cut my losses and get that cake. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, so glad I will, you did. <laughs> I will I will I uh, 
Uber eats you a slice after the show if you'd like. <laughs> or maybe I'll just make you a really nice cake that doesn't taste of hate crime. Um, yeah. <laughs> when all I, this is over, we'll have I, cake together. I love that plan. When's your birthday? March. So plenty Ooh. of time. Yeah. I'm April. Yeah. Oh. What's what number? 24. So I'm like a baby Taurus. I'm, I'm the 18th, so I'm but... like a cusp of Pisces. <laughs> mm. March 18th. That date rings a bell for some reason. I'll definitely remember that. And I'll make you a cake. Let's do it. Yay. Hey. All right. Well, yeah. Is it is it not Jeopardy time? It's not Jeopardy time. All right. So the way not... we're the not way. playing. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are going to play Not Jeopardy. Uh, we have three different categories that are all color co coordinated, but um, you probably can't see because of the quality, and I just tripped on my chair, but that's okay. Each are they category pink, white, has. White? Sorry? Are they pink, white, and are blue? They? I, I wish. Know. They uh, are pink, blue, and green. Pink, blue, and green. Okay. Yeah. So I have three four-sided dice that will all correspond with different categories and different questions. And we will go through until we run out. All right. Right. And your job, Alice, aside from answering questions, of course, is yeah. you get categories. I so, pick categories? Or you can, or you can go by, um, or you can go by color. So the categories, our lovely viewers who can't read my mind are <laughs> we are going to be discussing discussing addictions, eating disorders, and the trans experience. And a lot of these questions will all mesh together because, well, experience is experience. <laughs> yes. Oh, aren't we just a just the life of the party with these questions? <laughs> oh yeah. I love it. I love it. No, this is great. This is great. Heavy hitting topics. Mm -hmm. yeah. nice. But it's fun because I have streamers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fun because we're both super hilarious and charming. Exactly. Um, That's what makes it. <laughs> so I choose a topic and then you roll the dice? Is so I have my... Works? Yeah. Okay. So, um, or you can just go buy dice. My iridescent dice, my green dice, and my trans dice. Uh, let's do topics because. Okay. I don't. I don't know. Oh, you look so okay. Let's go with. Let's choose dice. Okay. <laughs> I'm just so proud of them because they're cute. Let's honestly, start I'm just with the iridescent dice. Righty. So that is our blue category. So we have number four. So I believe this is the heaviest question about the trans identity. Ooh, today's daily double. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? Okay. If you could choose not to be trans, would you? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I get so much strength and, and power and uh, pride from being trans. I... Oh my God, everything about me is you to be a <laughs> to be a cis man or a cis woman as a comedian, how fucking boring. Ugh, gross. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um <laughs> my my transness is at the core of who I am. And it's it's yeah, I wouldn't change it for a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. I like when I first came out, I probably would have like had a different answer, but I think now I agree. And that is definitely the result of me growing as a person because of it. Ooh, let's click on this comment because I love it. We have a comment. Uh, uh, Lady Raven. Yes. She was uh, on our last online edition of Comic Sans, uh, a very funny, amazing, super sweet comic from Sudbury, Ontario, 
who I met when I uh, did my first headlining set uh, in my hometown. And it was great. That's love awesome. you too. Love you too. Yay. Hey, love. That's awesome. Yeah, I think I would definitely, when I was first coming out and when I was first um, exploring those questions, I mean, obviously I didn't feel like I was a woman. So I I envied and I um what's the what's the commandment about your neighbors what covet? I coveted cis femininity and I, I coveted cis women very yeah. much. And I was like, I want that. Um but now I have that. So we're all good. <laughs> yeah. And it's in my own special way. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It's it's a journey that you're proud of and you're you're happy with who you are. And you know what? I'm happy with who you are too. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm happy with who you are. And I love your voice and I love having been able to hear your story and hear it change and hear it grow over the last year or so it's been such a short time but you've become this this great amazing like you started out as this great amazing person but now you're just doing so much and you have this incredible voice and you're doing great things so i love who you are thank you so much oh my goodness <laughs> oh, of course of course <sighs> I feel like I had something to say, but. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. That's okay. That's okay. I'm <laughs> glad to have feelings. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, thank, thank, thank you. I'm, yeah, I've been, um, like, I, I missed my comedy one year anniversary because of the plague. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I was laid off on my birthday, actually. That was fun. Ooh, I was once fired on my birthday. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Oh my. My boss was at least nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, we're sorry to do this on your birthday, but like. <laughs> oh, March eighteenth was supposed to be the date of uh, the Comic Sans Showcase in Waterloo, and the I Heart Jokes Awards. That's why. Yeah, that was right in the thick mm -hmm. of like quarantine really ramping up and people taking it seriously oh on your birthday on my birthday yeah i had a show that day it was i had a show in niagara and that's where my family's from so i had a bunch of family members going it was going to be like i was going to usurp a show pretty much <laughs> <laughs> oh i'm so sorry to hear that yeah it's it is what it is. It was unfortunate and sad when it happened, but now I'm just going, now I have an excuse to get even more extra for the next birthday, so <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Love it. All right. Are you ready for the next question? Yes, bring it on. Alrighty. Um, do you want to go by category? I'll let you use words this time. Okay, um, let's do addiction because that's something I, yeah, let's just do addiction. Okay. Hmm. Number one. How did coming out impact your addiction recovery? Um, that was really difficult to, I don't, coming out impacted my addiction because um by by coming out and becoming single and uh finding new friends who were like my friends and not my ex's friends and creating a community that really embraced me um i was going out and i was drinking a lot um so coming out negatively impacted my relationship with alcohol uh, in that I was being so much more social uh, in my in my personal life, but mm -hmm. 
but still had all of those insecurities and all of those social anxieties that um, I hadn't quite started to deal with yet. So I, I used alcohol as a crutch a lot. And uh, there were a lot of times where I was out drinking until three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, and I was working as a chef in a cafe. So I would have to be in the cafe for seven in the morning and I would sober up and the hangover would hit at around eight in the morning when I'm, you know, cooking eggs for people. And that's the worst experience. That's not pleasant. Um, yeah, so I had very, very difficult times and I uh, supplemented my confidence and my security with alcohol a lot. And then, obviously, as a comedian, um, suddenly I started performing comedy, so I was in bars every night. Mm -hmm. And then I would uh, get drink tickets and have a couple free drinks. And then, you know, I can have one drink, but I have two drink tickets. And I can have one drink or eight drinks, but I can't have just two. Mm -hmm. So it... Uh, yeah, coming out impacted my relationship with alcohol and with food quite a lot as well. Um, and I like to think of anorexia as an addiction in in a sense where, and it's much more difficult to to. Uh, abstain from that because with alcohol you're addicted to a substance and you just avoid alcohol uh, with anorexia I like to joke that you're really addicted to nothing <laughs> you're addicted to not things you're addicted to a complete absence of things um, of food so uh, um, the addiction is less with a substance and more with control and having that control over your body and dictating and determining how far your body can go and how much you can impact and manipulate your body um, in that sense of control is what you're really, really addicted to. Um, and in terms of addiction with controlling your body, transitioning and coming out was a huge factor in that because I... I finally had something to hyper-focus on. And I had something to say, this is the body that I need and I need to make these changes and I need to look a certain way and I need to be this feminine and I need to fit into this dress and this cute skirt and I need to look good in like tight and revealing clothing and all of these things. So uh, um, I went through phases where I, I never really feared that I was... I was relapsing back into anorexia, but I was certainly chasing a control over my body with working out and fitness and health and diet and very restrictive diets, um, going from vegan or vegetarian to vegan and using that as a scapegoat for not eating and avoiding calories and all of those things. Those really amplified. And I came probably very close to uh, to to being to to having an eating disorder in some sense again, uh, because I had realistic, unrealistic body image goals and unrealistic expectations that I placed on myself. Yeah, and all of that. Yeah. No, of course, it has such an impact on just like. Like when it's something that gives you almost a sense of relief or as you said, control. And when it's the only thing that gives you that sense of control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because like, like for me, that's exactly what it was, was it was just the only thing that I had because everything else, I was just kind of like a, like a leaf in the river, just kind of going through but every now and then, like, I, I don't know, like the bulimia frog would grab me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like it, um, it does become like a physical addiction as well. 
um, in regard to like, like your body get like, like gets sick from consuming. And like, I am um, for me being bulimic or like, you know, the, the gross one. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks. Man. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Bulimic, at least you're eating. <laughs> yeah. You know, at like least, for me, yeah. it's like a big, sorry. Uh, at least you're at, I don't know. I don't, I, I never thought of that association of bulimia as the gross one. And anorexia yeah. is like, I guess, yeah, it's the cool trendy one that all the models were doing, but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that just rubs me the wrong way. Like how you could call something the gross disease or the gross eating disorder. Yeah. I'm so sorry. And it's like, because like I've, um, I've struggled with symptoms of both. So it's like, I've had like, you know, I've kind of like dabbled between and I do definitely like when I'm experiencing more severe symptoms of bulimia, I do definitely feel more gross. So I guess like, like I, I get why that word is used, but, um, yeah. also rude. <laughs> it's so rude and it's so, Yeah. I don't have the words for it, but it's so completely insensitive to the condition. I think that's a I'm sorry, the comedy brain. Yeah, as I was saying, like like it's like just, a physical need sometimes. Like if I just like consume food, my body will just be like, Oh well, we don't need this, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember consuming food and, and having that feeling of food in my stomach where like you can actually mm -hmm. feel food in your stomach. And yeah. it makes you physically ill. Like your your body wants to reject food, or your mind yeah. is making your body want to reject food. Uh, I just when you said um, dabbled between anorexia and bulimia, I love that your your eating disorder was non-binary as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought about making that joke, and I was just like, ah. Uh. <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, Everything about me is indecisive. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, it's so complicated. The uh, the the relationships between like coming out and queerness and mental illness and addiction and all of these these struggles that we have. How they're all so interlaced and i think a big Absolutely. thing with me a big problem with me was that i didn't have things you know there are so many things if i go to a therapist it's like which of the five things do you want to talk about today is it gender is it adhd is it anxiety is it addiction is it depression like all of these things that I didn't know, you know, I was undiagnosed with ADHD until I was nearly 30. I think I was 26 or 27 when I was diagnosed. So, like, if one of those things was causing a problem with me, I didn't know how to pinpoint that and say that's gender that's making me cause that or that's ADHD that's making me cause that or that's, you know... Um, internalized homophobia that's making me I didn't have any of those things so I would just feel something and be like that's an arbitrary emotion coming from the ether like coming from anywhere in outer space and it's just hitting me so I didn't know how to compartmentalize those emotions and those issues and those struggles um, so at one point it was impossible to tell uh, these three categories apart mm -hmm. So this is going to be a really long podcast. Yeah, I was. I just was had, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, like, I did just have a moment of just like, like this. Uh, this episode is probably going to be longer than they usually are. And then you addressed it just as I was thinking about it, and I was just like, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to be more concise, but also, I'm There's here for so as long as you need me. There is. Yeah. Like like there's a reason why like like I've I've done an eating disorder episode and like n haven't scratched the surface. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like like mm -hmm. this is like like you're not my first trans guest but this is my first trans episode and again like I have four questions <laughs> and we still have the prelude and there's still so much to say.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm excited now. Let's do another. All right. Shall we go um, green only go or green. shall I make you pick? <laughs> uh, make me pick. So we trans. have trans. The trans. Let's get the yeah. Trans. I love my little trans dice so much. That's so cute. <laughs> it has glitter for the white part. <laughs> Four again. We're getting all the heavy hitters out of the way. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, what was your road to recovery like? Did you have a support network? Did your support network change after coming out? Um, it was very, very supportive. I had my partner at the time, uh, who was the first person I came out to as trans. Um, I came out to my sister, told her I was uh, gender fluid and struggling with questions about gender. She was the first person I, uh, I told about my transness. Um, but the first person I uttered the words, I'm a trans woman to was my partner at the time. She was, she was incredibly supportive. She worked for, um, her university's, uh, student union and she advocated for, uh, uh, trans, medical costs to be covered by the student benefits program and assisted other people with transitioning and just really, really advocated for them. Um, we had a mutual love of David Bowie as, as you know, the two of us do as well. Um, so I felt very comfortable coming out to her. Um, but where my transness impacted her identity or her public image, uh, there were a lot of issues. So at first she was incredibly supportive, but then again, I, I, you know, my tree anniversary is her birthday. So there were issues there and she, uh, felt kind of left behind by my transition and it was messy, but, um, I was afraid of coming out to a lot of my friends, uh, our mutual friends. We decided that I needed to come out because we were separating and people deserved uh, to know the reason why we were separating because we were together for 10 years. Why are we suddenly not working anymore? Um, so I came up with a coming out letter and I thought I'll just send it to one or two people, gauge their reaction and build up the courage again. And they're so supportive, it felt so good. It was addicting. Um, so in that one night, the list of 24 or 25 friends that, I had that I eventually wanted to come out to, I came out to them one by one and eventually just through like a big group chat and was like, hey everybody, this is what's happening. And everyone was absolutely supportive. Um, my sister was super supportive. My mom is the greatest. Oh my God, the, the first time I heard her refer to me as her daughter and her beautiful daughter. And just, she complained that she didn't have enough pictures of me and all of her my pictures were outdated because they were pre-transition like childhood photos so i was like i'm a narcissist i'm gonna send you a stack of photos like i'll print them out on my photo printer and i i sent them to her and within like 48 hours she had this enormous enormous photo mural on her wall of all of the photos of like me and me and me and my partner and me and my sister and my mom's coming to visit next week. I uh, thoughts and prayers to me. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but yeah, she's coming and I want to take a bunch of pictures with her and she's just supportive. Like she celebrates all of my milestones like uh, having my name and, and uh, sex designation changed on my ID. I'll send her photos. She's like, I'm so proud of you. And uh, yeah, she, uh, oh, my dad, my, I, yeah, my dad took it so incredibly well. I was hesitant about my dad because we, uh, 
we didn't have a very close relationship for most of my life. Uh, and when I came out, he just said, Dai, you're the most important thing to me and you're the most important person to me and what makes you happy makes me happy. And I was like, okay, token answer, good for you. Uh, and he lives in like, lived in a really small town. He passed away um, in November, October. Um, anyways, yeah, uh, I just didn't expect him to, to embrace me as much as he did. And he, uh, he came to visit uh, around the time, around showcase season a year and a half ago. And I took him out and I was like, this is my life. It's queer comedy. It's Church Street. It's all of these things. And he just, he had so much fun in the village surrounded by all of the gays. And he was just, I, yeah. And his pride, like I, he, he let me know that I was the most important person in his life. And I thought the coming out would have changed that, but it only enforced it. It only made it stronger. And yeah, it was, I had so much support. And then the support of all of my friends and comedians, you know, straight small town comedians who, you know, I would think I would be the last person for them to like, support and bring out to open mics and book on shows and things i've seen i'm very fortunate and i've seen very little adversity and very little um transphobia and very little there's there there has been so little holding me back and and just so many people embracing me uh my girlfriend trisha who just you know it's it's Transness is never a question. She's just the greatest thing. All of these people. I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. That that's amazing. I'm, I'm so happy for you. Thank you. It's hard and I feel a little guilty sometimes because I know I know the trans experience isn't easy. And I know I I get on a bit of a soapbox sometimes and say like you're not allowed to hate trans people and you're not allowed to to be transphobic on stage and you're not allowed to to beat down my community and I try to be really strong for my community. I know that the experience in general is so scary and so difficult for so many people and people lose family members, people lose their livelihood, people lose so much to be trans and I've just been gifted with this great community and this great network. I just want that for everybody. I want to be able to, to let people know that it can be that. Yeah, it's a great example. It's a, it's a true story. It's real and it happens. Not every trans story is a tragedy. Yeah, I've never, I've never felt, I, forced into sex work or uh, I've never been I've I've been poor I've I've been house insecure and and I've been under the poverty line and you know homeless in my youth and things but not because I was a trans person and none of those things ever happened to me because I was trans um yeah embracing who I was I think taught a lot of people to embrace who I was as well and helped a lot of people to be okay with it and be good with it. And uh, I want to keep doing that. It's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be the person that people need. And even if like someone doesn't get say the, the mom figure that they expected, sometimes you need, sometimes you can just be a supportive figure that someone needs in that same way, but you just have a different title. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be a mom figure and, to yeah, anyone who needs title. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a huge heart. There's room for, there's room for everyone. Yeah. yeah. It shows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are you. Can we ready? move on to another question? Because I'm getting yeah. happy. Now. I'm getting... Yeah, of course. We're <laughs> a few more. <laughs> All righty. Um, pick a category. <laughs> uh, let's do the one we haven't. Let's go with green. Three. 
Okay. How does your relationship with food impact your connection to the entertainment industry? Hmm. That's a really good question. And one that, one that I wish I had a better answer for. I don't, the only way I see those two worlds interacting is uh, when, when I have, auditions or casting calls and uh, I feel like if I have an audition coming up that my weight or my figure are going to be a barrier um, and a big part of the reason I've I've started restricting my calorie intake in the last few months or so has been because I know when things open up again, I'm going to be going into auditions and doing media spots and interviews and things like that. And I'm going to be very present um, on camera a lot. Uh, and I feel a pressure to be a certain size in a certain weight. Mm -hmm. um, my relationship with food is really deeply connected with my body image. Um, and uh, my body image is very well integrated into my uh, career as an entertainer. And even though as a comedian or a producer, I can totally get away with it because I don't think, you know, you don't have to be supermodel skinny and supermodel attractive to be a successful comic. Because look at Louis C.K. Look at all of these people. Um, look at Robin Williams and, and Stephen Wright and all of these people who are not stereotypically attractive, but were such great comics. Um, okay, Robin Williams was attractive in a weird way. <laughs> I love that man. Um, yeah, so I think there is a connection between those things, but I don't... Um, yeah, I don't think it's it's very pronounced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, it, it makes sense. It's, it only has as big of an impact as that mindset has, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I try not to make it. I try to, instead of eating less, I try to exercise more. And instead yes. of... Uh, putting on more makeup and and uh, trying on seven or eight outfits, I try to remind myself to sit down and uh, take five minutes and just be present and and tell myself that I'm okay and that I'm enough. That's yeah. absolutely great advice. I so often I do like the several outfits, several wigs, several makeup looks, like like until it's just right. And half the time I'm still like not satisfied, but good because there's just such a huge pile up of a combination of expectations and just things that you make up as you go along that you have issues with little things. And like for, for me, I, I can't calorie count. I can't weigh myself. I don't even know what size my clothing is. Like, cause I get so stuck in that mindset that it just becomes an obsession with me. So I get, um, I call it um, checkpointing. So like when mm -hmm. you have like, like that one dress that you want to fit in, and then when you fit in that dress, it's still like, like, but you have this other dress, and it and it just kind of becomes like nothing's ever enough, and that's how it can and get really dangerous to say, um, like I'll I'll love myself after I lose this couple these couple pounds because mm -hmm. that never happens <laughs> yeah and yeah and it just and it, it gets you in the mindset of i'm not there yet i'm not quite whole i'm not quite enough um and an important thing when it comes to um that kind of mindset in working with it is it, it works like like differently for everyone because everyone's issues are rooted differently but for me <laughs> i find um 
doing like like a lot of mindfulness exercises, meditating and mindful eating, which, which is literally like, like you count your bites to like enjoy each item, which it it sounds like it sounds like very tedious, but I do it because it helps me not feel guilty about what I'm eating as well as it slows down my intake. Yeah. So it's just, uh, yeah. And then <laughs> that's a really important point is, um, sorry, just one second. <laughs> Texting. Uh, Oh, yes. Just checking in with my girlfriend because she's locked in the bedroom. Um, yes. Is this not? I didn't lock her in the bedroom. I didn't. She's, you know, in the her own will. yeah, she's safe and she's free to come out anytime she wants. Um, no, I, I just it's one thing that I, I realize when I'm focusing on what I'm eating and trying to trying to count calories and things is that I lose my love and appreciation for taste mm -hmm. and I love food so much yeah. that like, I I have to taste like I just when you lose that aspect of food you lose so much of the joy in your life yeah, my um, my roommate and I have started a workout and meal plan and um, to help me kind of like get through it, um, like they're doing all of like the actual planning and just kind of like, like they'll give me a list of things like, like oh, we can choose from like, like a list of this to eat for this meal. And I'm just like, I just don't know what the calorie count is. And I'm just like, I just trust you. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. it works for me, but I've noticed like the recipes are so bland. I just rework all of them because it's just like seasoning has calories. I don't care. I need my oregano. I need oregano. I need salt. <laughs> oh, yeah. There are things that are so low calorie or so minimal that I don't like. Those aren't going to, you know, put Creole spice on your chicken. That's going to make me eat the chicken. It's going to make me enjoy it. You can't count. And I don't count coffee because I drink coffee black and don't fuck with my coffee i'm sorry yeah i don't i don't i i drink my coffee with chocolate almond milk and i don't count it so <laughs> so you can mm -hmm. get by with your black coffee <laughs> yeah because yeah. coffee um doesn't count because the caffeine burns the calories because it speeds you up so much that it balances out right mm -hmm. right sure, sure. <laughs> that's not real advice no one listen to me no 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Helpful in some question? ways. Yeah, yeah. The one. <laughs> category. Uh transness again. Transness again. Alrighty. I check, even though I know it's the trans dice. <laughs> oh, actually it's not. Oops. How can we improve trans storytelling? Um, trans representation by letting trans people portray trans characters, by letting trans people write trans characters and trans stories, um, mm -hmm. and also by normalizing it. Absolutely. It's plain and simple. Just put trans people in roles and don't make their roles and their story about transness. Yeah. Um, and when it is about transness, make it authentically about transness and stories that we want to tell and experiences we want to share. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. As, as I said earlier, not every trans story is a tragedy. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And not every trans person's story is a trans story. Yeah. We have other stories. We're more than the one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like as, like, like to quote myself again, it is a chapter in the memoir, not the thesis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a proposition for you. Okay. I'm having a lovely time. And I'm just wondering for the sake of people watching and for the sake of my cake, which might be mel melting, what if we did this as a two part? Okay and maybe save some questions for another time, maybe next week. 
so we have more time because I don't want to rush through this, but mm -hmm. I also don't want to uh, turn to, it into to... a five hour special. Yeah. And then like we would get fatigued and not give us quality questions. What do you, yeah. what do you think about that? Obviously it's up for, it's your show and whatever you feel is appropriate. I just wanted to maybe make a suggestion. I would love to come back again. Absolutely. I, I love that. I love that suggestion. I, I appreciate it so much. Um, I, I, I was I was getting very like conscious of the time. I'm like, like oh, we're at like 134 and we're just starting. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and it's been so week, wonderful. And it, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. I was going to say next week I do have um, my guest scheduled, but the week after that I don't. Great. So um, we can do that. And uh, my next week, because I'm just doing a trans marathon. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, All right. a trans, it's a trans show next week, too. And then we can double back. And oh, my goodness. Oh, this is going to be interesting. Do a part two. Yes. Yes. I love that. We've got a theme. Should we do one more question and then call it a night? All right. Let's see. OK, so I'm going to take a vote and say that we do one from green because then there'll be two each. Yes. But. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I like it. Let's roll the green. Oh, no. I literally got the only one that's taken. <laughs> oh. <laughs> one more roll. All right. Oh, we almost got Jeopardy. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> All right. All right, so an eating disorder question. Okay. What has your recovery looked like? Have you gotten professional help? And what methods helped you? Um, my, uh, my recovery was fortunately, um, my family recognized the signs pretty early. Um, and I have a very close relationship with my mother. So I was very honest about my eating habits. And um, she told me that we needed to fix this and I needed to get help. Um, I fell very sick one week. I was 16 or 17 and living on my own. Um, which was a catalyst for like, I don't know how to buy groceries. I don't know how to do laundry. I don't know how to cook. Oh, I don't know how to eat. Look at that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I felt really sick one week and I had a, uh, uh, like a paralytic fever. And uh, my friend came to visit me and then called my mom and said, Alice is sick can you come and pick her up? And she brought me home and uh, she forced me to move back home. And we uh, talked to a doctor and a dietitian and got me on a, um, uh, a food plan and a, a nutrition plan. Um, and I remember that was the first time I tasted whole milk because I had to have, you know, full fat homogenized whole milk and uh, being forced to drink it was terrible. Um, so that kicked the anorexia, like the the um, the marathon of starvation and the marathon of not eating. Um, and then I became more aware and more conscious of it. And my mom checked in with me a lot. Uh, and... I struggled with it and I think I passed the buck on to other, um, other terrible behaviors and, and found another way to try to control, um, my, my life. And then there was like experimentation with drugs and then alcohol came into play and things like that as well. Um, so it was never really resolved because I, you know, this was, far pre-transition boys didn't have eating disorders boys didn't have body image issues boys didn't have any of these things um and fortunately i was able to keep the weight off where i felt like i was at an okay weight for a couple of years where the the necessity to control my body really started to fade 
yeah. and I felt like I was faking it well enough is like being one of the popular kids and stuff like that 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 I felt that false um the false gratification from other places yeah mm -hmm. so it took a really long time it wasn't until I I met my ex like 15 years ago and she was um overweight and struggled with with eating disorders on the opposite end of the spectrum and uh, I when we met and started seeing each other I was once again relapsing into anorexia on a very very controlled diet um and uh, that's when sort of my alcoholism alcoholism or like substance reliance i started you know uh, spiking a little bit more as well and uh, i then i met my ex and uh, we had a lot of great conversations about food relationships and about dependencies and uh about body image and, and body dysmorphia and all of those things. And I was finally introduced to these concepts that I could translate and apply to myself. So she kind of gave me the tools to help and fix myself. But again, it was difficult because I didn't have anyone to talk to because nobody believed that boys could have, boys could be anorexic and that boys could have these issues. Yeah, like a big thing I noticed when I was um, going through and like I was in an eating disorder program and it was like every bit of information was just geared to, hey, ladies, hey, girls, this is what you really need to work on. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just like, I understand how that would be helpful for like Kelsey, but it just it really make like it made me feel uncomfortable. And I at like. What one thing I always struggle with is like I feel like I have like no right to feel uncomfortable because I'm like girl enough, but I, I get but I do also know that's false. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. just like my anxiety brain being like like you're wrong, and I'm like brain you're wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> that's not the story I was telling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another thing that happened to me that caused me to really. Um, avoid seeking help or avoid talking about my eating disorder uh, was that I um, I had a really good relationship with my foods and nutrition teacher in high school. And I came to her asking for advice and for help and to tell her. Um, and she said it was very unique for someone like me to have an eating disorder. And uh, she asked me if I would speak to her class that year, that semester, about it. Um, so I came into the class, and this was after I had finished school, but I came back and I was like, I used to be a student, and this was my favorite class. And I, um, you know, I, I recovered from anorexia recently. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And the first girl to raise her hand was this like skinny, pretty popular girl. And she was like, um, are you sure you had anorexia? Cause you don't look like really skinny to me. And I was like, that's a good question. That's a really good question. <laughs> um, yeah. And that caused me to like disbelieve in my, in my eating disorder for a while and really hide it again. Yeah. Yeah, I've had that. It's like I'm very um I'm large boned for an eight fab person. Mm -hmm. So I've mm -hmm. always just been like large. But I was never I've never um like my body now is the closest I've ever been to being overweight. But I would say like I've always felt the exact same about my body. Like no matter what, like like just it's just I've always seen the same kind of um, responses and, to what my body does. I've always felt the same pull. <laughs> yes, I can definitely relate to that, even even in transition and like physical medical changes. 
um, I can look back at pictures of myself and say, I looked so different back then, or I was much skinnier back then, or I, you know, I was bigger at this point, or, you know, I looked much more masculine at that point. But at, you know, looking back in retrospect, I can see that. But at those current moments, I was always, I always saw myself as I always do see myself. As yeah. someone who is overweight and too manly and large and bulky and not feminine enough and all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a huge struggle because we don't perceive ourselves accurately or objectively. And that's the root of geez, all three of these categories and more. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have so much more to talk about. I can't wait to talk for the next yeah. in, in two weeks and spend yeah, another, I feel, sorry. another two hours. It's going to be great. Uh, oh my goodness. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited already. I will be in a different location, so I don't guarantee streamers, but I will try. <laughs> Ooh, switching up. Yes. Excellent. All right. Yay. Thank you so much All for right. having me. Yeah, thank you so much for for touching base and like reaching out and being a part of the show. This has been a fantastic conversation. I have appreciated every moment of it. Me too. Um, I, I, I hope all our, our viewers have been enjoying and have maybe learned something about either us or yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yay, uh, um, thank you. Yeah, you, you're so welcome. Um, uh, I will. I will end the broadcast now, and I hope everyone has an excellent night. <laughs>